today we begin in the writings. We only most of what we have left, except for one book, Jude, are all written by the same person. Who knows who that is? John, John the Apostle, the disciple of Jesus. What are some of the biographical things that you know about John? Yes, Ricardo. Yes, he was exiled to Patmos. Yep at least until for the majority of his later adult life or for a long period before he went back and tradition has it that he died uh, back in uh, the mainland, so to speak. Yes? He was a disciple of Jesus. He was a disciple of Jesus, intimately associated and related to Jesus' earthly life and ministry. He knew the Lord well, and he made a point to speak of that We'll look at that in his letter today, and that is important for us as far as tradition goes in our view of Scripture. He was an eyewitness of the Lord. Um, this is only one side of it. Oh. Um, if your name is not on the uh, attendance sheet, you can just fill it in. It didn't print two-sided, so uh, thanks. You can just write it in there to the present. See, eyewitness of the Lord. What else do we know about John? There was something about John's life that was very different than the rest of the disciples, the apostles. What was that, Angelica? Wasn't it that like they tried to kill him and they couldn't? Because, it, well, his life, his lifespan yeah. and his death. Because yeah. Doesn't he boil, try, they tried to boil him in a whale or something like that. He tried to do something. I don't remember what it was. There are some different traditions about the different disciples and so and I've heard that one I don't know I've never read that one specifically so but they attempted that and, yeah Scott there's a, at one of the end of the gospels or something they're talking about what's that at, at one of the end of the, oh. one of the gospels they're talking about John and how he was like he, he was gonna stay until Christ's return or something right uh, one of you some reference to that and they were like does that mean he's gonna live, live forever and he's like his life is not important to you but like it's like yours Right? Yeah, so Jesus people, said to Peter, yeah, right? Yeah, so some people think, like, he never died. Right, and it, it, the legend began that early on, that shortly after Jesus' ascension, John is writing in there at the end of his gospel about himself in that way, saying that because of the Lord, in a conversational way, correcting Peter, saying to Peter, First, he said it was like a figure of speech, saying, what is, if he lives in, until I return, what is that to you, Peter? You follow me. And then out of that, Peter obviously reported that, and then a legend grew that John would be one who would live forever. And uh, he didn't live forever, but he did live a whole lot longer than the other apostles. The other apostles died violent deaths, executions, and they were martyrs for the faith. John suffered for the Lord, exile and persecution, but he died a peaceful death uh, at, a, at an old age. And extra biblical tradition has it that he was still active until the very end to where he could no longer walk and carry himself to the churches that he ministered to. And so his disciples would carry him in body would carry him and take him into the building even when he was so weak that the only thing he could say to them was children of the Lord love one another and that was all he could get out and I'll tell you what if you can only get five words out to the people you love and have pastored for years and those five words you choose they're going to be important aren't they that's more than five words. I didn't count them, but children of the, of, of God love one another. Yes. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't think this is in the Bible, but on, I read that on all of Roman writings, uh, it says that he would, like they tried to murder John, mm -hmm. and it failed. Like That's they they couldn't burn him. Because they were trying to burn him with oil. Mm -hmm. So then, after that, they exiled him to Babylon. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he's, he's Mar 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 
Yeah, miraculous. Yeah. Yeah, that's what Angelica was saying. I'd like to read that. I've heard that and just haven't looked at that. About it. I know it was Domitian that exiled him. Another one of our, um, another one of our Antichrist figures, despots, dictatorial, um, horrible rulers. And so, yeah, that's that would be worth looking into. So here we are in his letters to believers. John is the author, then. We want to know about John. He has an important place in the New Testament. He wrote John's Gospel. This is the same John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. And someone might say, why, if we already have his Gospel, why do we need to hear it again? Why does he have three letters? Why didn't he just send his Gospel around? Anyone have a thought on that? When we think about Shepherding and ministry and seasons and years. Yes. That's right. To where he was presently and to the people that he had influence over when he became a prominent leader in the early church. Very prominent. Pastor in the church at Ephesus. And out of that had an apostolic role among other churches, which we see from Revelation because of the seven churches of Revelation. So he's speaking into those churches, the Lord using him to speak to them. Um, so they need to be spoken to and they need to hear. And it was John, an eyewitness of the Lord, and has a place in Scripture. Uh, but there was an expansion that took place in John's teaching. He was doing more than just reporting or uh, recording and spreading the gospel. He is now explaining and interpreting Christ for believers in the church. And these letters uh, have a very important place. Okay, a few things here about 1 John, written by John the Apostle. Written to Greeks in Asia Minor. Ephesus, where he pastored later in his life, was in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, as were the other churches of Revelation. Um, and... There's some things we put together here that help us to know the times and place. He warns against idols. He deals with docetism. And we'll look at that in a little bit uh, in our next class session, I believe. Look in a little more detail of what this heresy that was growing in the early church was that he is writing against. Um, but it's, the gist of it is that it denied the humanity of Christ. If you deny the humanity of Christ, that he was uh, somehow a spirit being or was a human who was indwelt with the, with the Christ spirit that came and went, you lose the, resurrect, the cross and the resurrection don't mean anything anymore. And so you can see why this was so important here. Though unnamed in the letter, the author was an eyewitness of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. The early church fathers identified the author as John the Disciple, almost all of the prominent church fathers in the beginning of the life of the church, recognize this as John's writing, and that gives us reliable tr tradition to give it the title uh, or to say that it's from John. And furthermore, the style is similar to that of the Gospel of John, with many similarities in content. Someone turned to Let's backtrack to John's Gospel, John chapter 20, verse 31. Could someone go there? I want you to notice something. John 20, 31. And then we're going to look at, this is just one similarity. Okay. When you're there, if you're ready to share that with everyone, can you show me your hand? John 20, 31, John's Gospel. Okay, Jared, Good. read that to us, good and loud, and then we're going to make a comparison to something in 1 John. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, thank you. That was from John's Gospel. He said, these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. He gives clearly his intent for writing. He wants people to hear and believe. Listen to this. 
1 John 5.13 I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life something similar there, isn't it? It almost sounds like the same thing reworded because it is. You see the similarities of the author here. And there are many other places in uh, his letters here that are similar to his style of writing and his approach in John's Gospel. So we're stepping outside now and we're looking at it as far as issues of authorship and what does uh, scholarship tell us. Even the most basic scholarship, if you go and make comparisons of content, you find so many connections, we can say, it is reliable tradition. This was written by John, not someone later who uh, was claiming to be John, as some scholars may say, liberal scholars, saying, no, this was not John, this is someone else, and therefore is not a reliable or authoritative word on Christ and the church. This is what happens where they take that. So we want to say we have all the reasons to believe, and then some. This is written by John the disciple. Okay. The purpose of 1 John is to encourage healthy Christian community through right beliefs about who Christ was and is. Not because they had never heard it before, but because of the infiltration of wrong beliefs and wrong views of Jesus. Once again, problems, opposition, and the twisting of the right story and the right perspective on Jesus that came from the disciples and from Jesus himself has once again given rise to the need for a clear and direct letter that teaches about Christ, which has then become for us a timeless tool for teaching truth about Jesus. Though some of these things were time bound, they are timeless for us because of the way that they give such a clear and direct teaching about the, the um, nature of who Christ was in his life and person. Okay, also to encourage loving fellowship in the life of the church. John's writings are full of love, filled with love, affection, sensitivity, and you see that even in the in the accounts of Jesus and the disciples together, John, the affection he had and the way that he was more sensitive, it uh, seems, than some of the other disciples. And that shows up in his writings. There's so much emphasis on loving each other. Love one another. He is, takes special care to report on Jesus' teachings on love and gives us much on um, teachings about love. And it fits that his final words to the church is all he could get out was love one another. That sounds like John, doesn't it? John's letter can be viewed as a counter teaching against false teachers infiltrating the church. We will see this in 3 John especially. 1 John of the, of the 1, 2, and 3 John, um, depends on where you're from. Uh, if you're an American, you would say 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. If you're from England, <laughs> yeah. and uh, same books. Huh? <laughs> it, first John is uh, a little more uh, meaty. Second John is short. Third John is super short. So we will do both of those in the same. We'll do uh, second and third John, or two and three John, in the same class session. And in the background of all of these letters are is the problem of these infiltrating false teachers. <laughs> Teachers and preachers who had traveling ministries and their entourage sometimes, they're being supported by the churches in what was customary for teachers in the early church that were traveling evangelists and uh, apostles or so-called apostles, is that they would come to an area and they would connect with the churches and then they would receive hospitality of members of the churches, stay in their homes, be fed by them, and then receive gifts and support from the churches. And these teachers, some of them were false teachers, were riding in on that hospitality, by all appearances, were just like all of the other evangelists and teacher associates of the disciples. John had teachers that he sent out 
his disciples and ministry partners, so to speak, that he was sending out as traveling ministry people. By all appearances, they looked just the same. They were talking about Jesus. They, were, they had been at other churches. But then all of a sudden, on Sunday morning, during their message, people are saying, wait a minute, what did he just say? <laughs> what? Jesus wasn't a real human being? Wait a second. We need to talk about this after. And the, the clarity came, oh, this is a false teacher. And now this whole set of home groups over here is all confused. People are crying and saying, uh, John, uh, John, was John wrong in all the things he taught us in the church? And what should we do? And these false teachers were coming in, and John wanted to correct us. And he's, some of this we get from knowing what was happening in the churches and in Asia Minor during this time. And then from 3 John, we have the opposite effect, which we will see, where we had someone who was creating problems because he would not even receive the traveling ministers who were direct associates of John himself. So we flip it. It's very interesting when we look at that way. John was upset about that. Um, okay, so some of the themes, and we're going to take some time today to look at some of these themes. We're going to read through correct beliefs about Jesus. We kind of have it broken down here went through the letter where he, similar to the book of James, the theme is introduced, picked up, and shows up in some small expansions uh, throughout the book. So we have five chapters in 1 John. Turning from sin, fellowship of the saints, forgiveness of our sins in Christ, and that we are loved as children of God. These are the themes we just about covered the whole of 1 John with these sections. Anybody need me to go back there? Um, you can always, now when you download the update, this will be on there. Okay, I want to read to you these first four verses of 1 John, and I would like you to hear, I want you to start with hearing his emphasis on being an eyewitness of Jesus and how that is part of his authentication for his word being authoritative to the church. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. There aren't many people that can say that. There were very few who were voices in the church that were able to say that right there. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. It's a very clear word from John. In the tradition we have in, of viewing Scripture, the high view of Scripture that we have, the high view of the New Testament writings, is not something that came about much further on. It began with this kind of recognition that those who were eyewitnesses of the Lord or who were directly associated with eyewitnesses of the Lord like John, have a voice of authority in the church that no one else has on what is right and true about the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. You hear that? How he starts out with that emphasis. That's not something any of you or I would ever be able to start our next sermon with. That which I have seen with my eyes, heard with my ears, and touched with my hands. No. We, we grow in our experience of God, in our collection, so to speak, of encounters and testimony and God working in us and revelations. 
but this is a unique word here, a word of authority that very few have. And that is so important in our understanding of scriptural tradition um, and its place in the life of the church. It is a voice of authority. Before we look at some of these themes, this will bring, um, if you haven't been, if your interest hasn't been really piqued this morning, this ought to be. Hopefully. John and the Antichrist. See, I got you. Right there. Some of you just right now, whoa, you shook out of it. And Monday morning, 8 o'clock class. Ooh, controversy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, John is huge on the Antichrist. He really is the biggest in the New Testament. And then we have Paul and Jesus. Um, but John is our main spokesperson in the New Testament for the Antichrist. In 1st and 2nd John, and in Revelation 13 and 17, it's worth writing this down. John's word on the Antichrist. There, there, are, there may be other references, but these are primary references. First and second, John, see some of you are already saying, oh, these little letters from John have things about the Antichrist. Oh, my. First and second John, yeah, he fit it in uh, big time in, in his, these little letters. And then Revelations 13 and seven, uh, Revelation 13 and 17, hear these words. John refers to the spirit of the Antichrist as well as a person and people who are Antichrists. I would like for you, as we finish out this course in these final two weeks, to have a broadening view of New Testament doctrine New Testament perspective on Antichrist. Who is the Antichrist? What is the Antichrist? I would like for you to let that view broaden and uh, take on a Johanian view. I haven't said that word very often. Johanian. Not even sure if I said it correctly. John refers to the spirit of the Antichrist as well as a person and people. Three identifications of Antichrist in the New Testament, who are Antichrist. It seems clear from John's teaching here and elsewhere that the Antichrist is to be understood as something more than a last and final great enemy of God, although that is certainly included, but I couldn't fit that on that slide. I just figured I'd try to remember to say it before someone falls back in a chair or something. So. Uh, so it certainly is included, but it is something more than just or only a final great enemy of God. And for now, I have one more uh, set of thoughts here on this. When we bring together John, First and Second John, Revelation 13 and 17, and Paul and elsewhere on the Antichrist, this is a very brief summary introduction to this today. The Antichrist is a spirit or spiritual disposition. We all have spiritual dispositions today. We have a disposition. We have a way about us that has been formed in our thoughts, in our uh, spiritual level of spirituality and its embodied attitude that we carry in approach to life and people and God, we have a disposition today. And I'm thankful that this room is full of good dispositions. And sometimes we refer to that as a spirit about a person, although at times, of course, spirit can refer to a separate supernatural entity that has entered a person, like the Spirit of God, or a demonic spirit. But in this case, I'm speaking of a disposition, a spiritual disposition that becomes embodied in wicked people. This, and I'm summarizing here New Testament teaching on the Antichrist. 
a spirit or a spiritual disposition that becomes embodied in wicked people who deny Christ, spreading through the ages in various powerful persons, and I would say absolutely <coughs> demonically inspired, if not then becoming an avenue for demonic possession of these certain persons. Spreading through the ages in various powerful persons and culminating in a final person who embodies the Spirit just before the return of Christ. So you see, we're in the Antichrist Spirit has already been in the earth and has already set itself up and been embodied and expressed through people long ago who have long since lived and died. And continues through the ages. This is right from the teaching of John. He says, has come, has, uh, is coming, and has already come. Been embodied by other people, powerful people especially, but certainly can be embodied by those who may not have a large influence, but just influence people in their, in their circle or where they work or something. And one day will be embodied in one last Antichrist who will be the final powerful person, so to speak. Is it safe to say that probably 99% of American uh, or modern teaching on the Antichrist has tended to focus on that last person. Saying that, you know, really, we, none of this has been fulfilled yet. And I would ask you, let's, uh, ha do we bring in correctly then uh, John, the rest of John's teaching in these passages to say what else is the Antichrist for us? So powerful persons. When we think of Antichrist, I like to think of this as a force in the earth that gets set up in people who then become a force in the earth, powerful people who have major influence. When we're talking about an Antichrist, a significant Antichrist person, most likely will have a major influence politically or economically, despots, dictators, tyrannical leaders, kings, and emperors who use their power to oppose Christianity. You have that in place, and you have an antichrist right there, who oppose Israel or Christianity, oppose the people of God, and are otherwise um, wicked and violent and murderous and dupe a lot of people. And we have certainly had that spread out through the ages. <coughs> We have that today. And yet there will be a final one before the return of Christ. Okay. What think you? <laughs> Jared. So, um, just to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying about the three different parts of the Antichrist. I'm sorry, I'll turn um, around. Just to clarify the three parts that you're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. The spirit of Antichrist is anyone that is not of Christ. What that is, like, it's anyone who's not in Christ because, like, I don't know, I'm just confused, like, who exactly can have an Antichrist spirit? Is it anyone who's not of Christ? I would say they possibly could, but John, in these letters, refers to them as people who oppose right teaching or perspective about Jesus who are in opposition and are actually then seeking to turn other minds away from sound teaching on Jesus. So it's not anyone who's not of Christ, it's just those who are in direct conflict of... Yes, conflict is important. Of, of, conflict. So those yeah. that are, are at the forefront of the conflict against Christianity, not everyone else is not us. Right. Okay, so yeah, no. So, like I have a friend uh, that I sent a text message to yesterday, uh, I sent him a scripture, and uh, he's a family man, has a young family, needs the Lord, and he is not interested in religion, but we're friends. And like if often if I forget to send him a note, he will often send me a note on Sunday and say, hey, I hope your family has a great Sunday. And, uh, but he's not interested in 
religion or faith. So, but I send him, like yesterday, I sent him this nice little, with the version Bible now, you can apply scriptures to these nice little pictures, you know, and I've always liked those kinds of sunsets and everything. And, um, or like, uh, you know, foggy colors with a person there, and then you put the scripture. I always like those things. So, and I sent him one of those yesterday, and he replied back and said, uh, I wished him a happy Sunday with his family, and it's a beautiful day. And he was very warmly responding, you too, I hope you have a great Sunday. He lives in Rochester. And uh, so I gave him a, just a little friendly witness there. He doesn't believe, but he is not in opposition to the faith. Is he susceptible to this kind of spiritually empowered disposition setting on him? Oh, yeah. But I wouldn't say that he's an antichrist. So when we're saying anti, um, it's there's the word you use, conflict. Anti is important. That first part of that word is the against Christ, is seeking to turn people away from sound teaching. And so, um, yeah. And by the way, I sent that to two other people that don't know the Lord. My <coughs> nice little scripture slide with the sunset and people sitting on the beach. Um, and uh, one of them, it was, it was fitting that it was from First John, because I've been reading First John a lot. And uh, one of them replied, and it said, as, if, as we have so been loved, so we also ought to love one another. John said. And this big, gruff guy I sent it to, who scares people, intimidates people, because of his personality and his use of the English language, um, replied back and said, I want you to know that I love you. And I looked at that text message and I said, did I just read that from this guy? I love you. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> and so, so it's good fruit that can come from little picture slides sometimes. Peter. So where then would you draw the line between uh, just not interested and like opposing? Because if someone asks the guy, hey, do you think God is really think Jesus died on the cross? And he said, no. Like, right. it doesn't get more opposed to <coughs> that, right? Well, there, I would say there's a difference between disagreement or unbelief and opposition. John's concern was, this John, was people and persons and groups of people who were seeking to infiltrate the church or undo the church they were, they were against the church, and they were acting out in a, against the church, rather than just someone that just says, uh, you know, I believe. Like a, my son's party the other day. <coughs> my son's turning 13 soon, so we had, we had his party early with his friends. And uh, one of his friends is not a believer, and um, he's a really nice guy. And he said... Uh, he asked me, what, so what is it that you do again, Mr. Sanders? Aren't you a teacher or something or a college professor? He must have gone on to YouTube and he saw some of these videos from class. You know, I mean, just we're in class here. And then he said to my son, they're buddies from school, he said, you know, I hope that your, your dad and your parents don't get a bad view of me that I just don't, I'm not really into religion. I am a non-religious person, that's what he said. I'm non-religious. But I just, you know, I hope that your, you know, your dad doesn't uh, get a bad view of me for that. So he's just non-religious, this kid. Doesn't have faith, doesn't believe, but he's not opposing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you think who you were originally talked about would be somebody like Saul before he met the Lord? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then, boy, does that put a new spin on the story here of, or of the, our perspective of the United Christ. Oh, boy. He was uh, in that mode of opposing Christ. And instead of him being someone that God will crush, in Paul's case, he was delivered. Unbeknownst to him, selected by God, 
And the power of the Spirit blasted Paul, and he was delivered of that, and Christ revealed to him, and he became the great apostle of the early church. Boy, there's a thought to think about. Although then we would want to say, can we directly apply anti-Christ to Paul? Although in every other sense I would say, oh yeah. But whether that was a de he was demonically uh, indwelt or something, I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say that. But he was certainly set up in his mind, in his beliefs, his disposition was fully anti-Christ. Oh yeah. Wow. Look what God can do. But we know that some, that's not what God has in mind for them. He has in mind to crush them because of their opposition. So, yes? Would you say that um, a person <coughs> has the anti-Christ spirit? Like, so when we have the Holy Spirit, we know we have the Holy Spirit because we ask the Holy Spirit to come, like we accept Jesus. Like, would you say like somebody like like Hitler, who was clearly an antichrist, was he filled with the, uh, the spirit of the antichrist, and then did what he did in the power of the antichrist, or did he do what he did and then was filled with, because of his actions with the spirit of the antichrist? Um, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that the only reason that he became—I believe he was a, like a super demonized, super demonized. But I wouldn't be comfortable saying that it is entirely because of his choice that he became so evil. That's a yeah. That's a separate discussion. But this, I would say we let's recognize him as an antichrist who uh, was given power for such a long time. His, the havoc he wreaked on the earth. It's hard to speak of in a few words. So, um, yeah, but I would say certainly freedom was involved. Uh, but I don't, you know, sovereignty and freedom is something that I believe we have to be comfortable with not being able to clearly define. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm so comfortable with it, but I am. So, yeah, Ricardo. <coughs> Well, like, at the end of the day, it's not our choice to pick who is the Christ and who is just a believer, no? Because if we go with that mentality to preach, we're going to stop preaching to the people, oh, you are under Christ, I'm not going to preach to you, and you are unbelievers, I'm going to preach to you. Right. Well, I think the time for the church to be able to speak out, to say we have an antichrist here, or to be able to receive, have the need for conversation is when we have a time like John in the early church where John is in Revelation giving codes to speak of a wicked antichrist ruler and was calling their attention to that. Um, that he's in the world, he is opposing the church, he's evil, and is ultimately uh, Satan's messenger on the earth and is, uh, is doomed. And so, yeah, I don't think though that we need to be going, that our, that our call from God as believers is to go looking around the world to identify all of the antichrists. Not at all. But we should be watchful, and uh, maybe I should say <coughs> not at all, but we should be watchful and discerning and aware, uh, especially with powerful persons and made of major influence in the world. Um, but then keeping mixed in here, John, and see here again, this is speaking, Ricardo, of, that, of the one segment of Antichrist in the New Testament that has to do with powerful people, powerful, wicked leaders. Where the other segment that we get from John's letters here are those who have infiltrated the church but are perverting the gospel and seeking to turn people away from a true gospel message. So they were groups of people and teachers who were antichrists and uh, carrying that, um, that attack on the Christian message, which I would say is a very demonically inspired. So. It's more than just doubts or uh, 
inquiries into exploring the faith. These were people who were against it. Yeah. Jerry. Well, was there one of the things, I think it was John Catullus, no, this is the piece that you look for when you're hearing a teacher if they're an antichrist, they deny who Jesus is. Yeah. And that's not the difference if you know an antichrist and someone just teaching something non-biblical. Mm -hmm. like you have like an evolution biologist teach in high school that and teach Christianity, but they're not an Antichrist figure because right. they're not be teaching against Jesus. They're just not teaching something biblical, right? And yeah, that um, that could be a sort of a comparison there. Uh, you have someone who's teaching um, someone that's teaching something that isn't real sound biblically. Uh, let's say uh, that we would say, "Oh, that's a Christian teacher there." Or preacher, where did they get that from? Wait a minute. And we have one of those kinds of <laughs> recognitions. Wait, wait a second here, I'm not sure about that. But if it's not in opposition to the gospel, and right teaching about the identity, identity of Christ, who he is, who was, is, then it's not Antichrist. Yeah, and that's, we, this is important. We want to filter that through these letters. These letters give us that perspective of who is John talking about when he's talking about antichrists here? Those who, te who deny Christ. And that means the, the primary elements, the non-negotiables, New Testament non-negotiables of the person of Jesus. Yeah? I know that you know, the antichrist will be coming at the end, as it, as it says in the uh, second Thessalonians and mm -hmm. John. But all these people throughout history in the Bible that have the spirit of the antichrist, is there a literal, actual, Antichrist spirit that these people are being filled with, or is it is it just the way they're thinking and the intent of their hearts? So, as in uh, this one super powerful spirit that when that person dies, it goes off and finds someone else. Well, like like right now, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is yeah. a literal, actual spirit. Is there a literal, yep. actual Antichrist spirit in the world today? I believe that there are demonic <coughs> powers whose. Um, Appointment is to twist people's thinking, yeah. especially those who are inside the church or have uh, significant power in the world, those two things, to oppose Christianity. So I believe that it is demonically rooted, but I don't know, you know how many or yeah. if there's only one superpower yeah. being. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, like the Holy Spirit is in our bodies, and when we die, our bodies are buried, and we're with the Lord, and the Holy Spirit's still here, still filling other people. Um, so, uh, I, I would say that that's a room for different views on that, as a non essential of views of that. Yeah, but I would say it was demonically inspired. Yeah. Okay, David. Not, not to personalize or the Antichrist spirit too much, but the, which do you think the Antichrist spirit is, is more concerned about, if you will? Is, he, is this spirit more, con more concerned about opposing Christ politically, or is he more concerned about attacking his church? Hmm. Or, um, or maybe the answer is any, any way possible to mm -hmm. undo the influence of the church in the world. <coughs> Politics, economics, um, media for a bad person, a bad egg in the leaders, among leaders, bad eggs. That's what Paul, that's what John is saying, that they are here. And we know they went out from us and we know that they weren't really a part of us. And they're here. And they're doing their thing. Because we think of this as really political, but I think it goes really, really beyond that. Oh yeah, that we tend to almost entirely Think of the political kind, the dictators and the wicked world rulers and things. And that is certainly in scripture. But also there's this other element of this is an ongoing thing with people that are opposing sound teaching about Christ. So, yeah, we want to do think more than just politically. We want to think influence and presence in the church. So, mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I, was, uh, I hope that I have given you a 
a broad way of at least viewing it at this point without making any of those ultimate in the sense of saying you can't have all of them. I do believe we want to have all of these perspectives on the Antichrist. We don't want to emphasize one at the expense of the other, but, uh, we, but we also don't want to give undue emphasis as far as New Testament emphasis goes. We want to bring all of that together, knowing that there is a last one. We thank the Lord that that will eventually come to an end. <laughs> that day, there will be a final day of the Antichrist spirit in the world. Hallelujah. Okay, have a blessed day.